A viewer sent me an email about the influx of illegal aliens on our southern border. The question of whether or not this constituted an invasion and thereby requires a response to the federal government under Article 4, Section 4, is one worth taking a closer look at. Not only the question of does this constitute an invasion, but what are the consequences of such a point of view? So we'll discuss that next on the Constitution Study. Hello there, everyday Americans, and welcome to the Constitution Study, where we read and study the Constitution. We teach the rise and generation to be free. I am glad you could join me. As always, please head to the website, constitutionstudy.com, for all the information you want. You, you want the text version of this episode, you'll find it there. You want previous videos, previous articles, it's all there. You want to know where I'll be speaking or invite me to come speak to one of your events, it's all there. Now, I'll talk a bit more about that and some other things at the end of the video, but for now, let's Let's dive into this idea of a Southern invasion. Under Article 4, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution, the United States is required to guarantee to the states certain things, including the protection against invasion. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion and on application of the legislature or of the executive when the legislature cannot be convened against domestic violence. The first thing we need to determine is, does the influx of a large number of illegal aliens constitute an invasion? Well, we start where we start with all definitions of words with a dictionary. Invasion is a noun, a hostile entrance into the possession of another, particularly the entrance of a hostile army into a country for the purpose of conquest or plunder, or the attack of a military force. Are the people who are illegally crossing our border hostile? Some of them are but the vast majority don't appear to be so. Hostile is an adjective, belonging to a public enemy, designating enmity, particularly public enmity, or a state of war, inimical as a hostile band or army, a hostile force, hostile intentions. While their presence is problematic, that does not make them a public enemy. The enemy is a noun, a foe, an adversary. A private enemy is one who hates another and wishes him injury or attempts to do him injury to gratify his own malice or ill will. A public enemy or foe is one who belongs to a nation or party at war with another. The vast majority of those illegally crossing our borders do not belong to a nation or a party that is at war with the United States. Neither do most of them make up a hostile band or army. Now, regardless of their size, these people do not constitute an invasion as our founding fathers defined it when they wrote the Constitution. Neither, by the way, do they meet the legal definition of an invasion. From the Free Legal Dictionary, an invasion is the entry of a country by public enemy making war. So if this dramatic influx of illegal aliens doesn't meet either the constitutional or legal definition of invasion, what is it? Well, let's start at the beginning. Constitutionally speaking, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4 gives Congress the power to establish an uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcy throughout the United States. Notice, Congress has the power to set rules for naturalization, the, the act of becoming a citizen, but not for immigration or visitation. Immigration is becoming a permanent resident, while visitation is a temporary one. This means that according to the 10th Amendment, the power to regulate immigration or visitation is retained by the states. Therefore, this should be primarily a state issue. However, decades ago, the states allowed the United States to usurp their control over immigration into the states, which leads us to the next point on our journey. Since the states now expect the United States to regulate immigration, Congress has passed numerous laws to do so. Why is this important? Because each and every member of Congress has been hired by the American people to represent them, either in the House of Representatives or for their state in the Senate. Now, whether you like our country's immigration laws or not, they were created by employees of the people who represent them and exercise their sovereign power in the people's name. Congress, though, is not the only branch of the federal government responsible for this mess. See, while Congress is tasked with making the laws of the United States, the president is required to faithfully execute those laws. Since the state legislatures have decided to allow their citizens to determine who their state should vote for in the presidential election based on their political party affiliation, 
the men who have held the office of president in the last several decades got there by the will of the American people. So there are two branches of the federal government that are part of this mess. Congress for the laws they have passed and the president who has failed to execute those laws. The fact that millions of people have violated those laws without consequence is not entirely their fault. Yes, the illegal alien is responsible for the laws they have broken, but Congress is responsible for the bureaucratic nightmare that anyone who wishes to come here legally must go through. Also, the president is responsible for the incentive many of these aliens see, since there are effectively few consequences for breaking American law. Now, our current border crisis should be a surprise to no one. History is replete with examples of what happens when laws are not enforced. The rate of illegal aliens entering our country is directly correlated to the leniency shown by the presidential administration in office at the time. You would think after 50 years of observing this correlation, the American people would have figured it out. Apparently not. Even though this cause and effect has been readily observed throughout the United States, Currently, there are two district attorneys in California facing recall because their failure to prosecute crime has led to an intolerable increase in those crimes. Businesses in these cities are closing because of the level of theft they are forced to endure without any redress, because prosecutors have decided to be derelict in their duties and not prosecute crimes they don't think are worth it. Now, while many in California and, in fact, America as a whole are rightly angered by the current state of what is laughably called our justice system, there is one point they seem to have missed. Neither of the district attorneys currently facing recall in California made any secret of their stance on prosecuting what they often refer to as petty crimes. President Biden campaigned on the idea of allowing people into the country illegally, then dealing with them after the fact. He promised to suspend deportations and detention of migrant families and reduce room for immigrant detention. So why is anyone surprised that millions are taking advantage of the promises to be lax on enforcement of U.S. law? Now, before you start pointing your finger at President Biden and his administration, there's one very important point you need to consider. See, knowing what President Biden planned to do when he entered office, tens of millions of Americans voted for him. The current state of our border crises is a direct result of the choices made by the American people. In other words, both President Biden and our alleged invasion are our fault. I believe there are two primary reasons behind this call to declare what's happening on our southern border an invasion. Now, first, there are those who want to use the term invasion to prod the federal government to act under Article 4, Section 4. I've even seen some people go dictionary shopping to find a definition that will promote their cause, ignoring the fact that the sense of the word they are basing their claim on is not the primary sense, even in the dictionaries they quote. I expect this approach to be another utter failure since it basically is trying to shame the president into doing what he's already said he would not do. Now, if the president won't enforce current immigration law, what makes you think he's going to do so because you call it an invasion? He has paid no political price for his position, so why should he change just because you altered the language? Second, and of even more concern to me, is the attempt to define the surge of illegal border crossings as an invasion is an unconscious attempt to redirect the blame onto someone else. If this truly were an invasion, those entering the country would be considered hostile. There are many in this country that would use such a designation as an excuse to blame the alien for all of their problems. This is already the case in many locations. The lack of jobs, overflowing of our schools, hospital and medical clinics are blamed on the influx of illegal aliens. Now, while in many cases that may be true, it's rather like blaming the Titanic itself for its sinking rather than its crew. Most Americans drive faster than the speed limit because they know there's a little chance of actually getting pulled over. If you knew there was very little risk that you would actually be punished, how many of you would turn down the chance to rob a bank, cheat on your taxes, or even assault that idiot who cut you off in traffic and gave you the finger? Or what if you could earn 10, 20, 30 times more than you do today, and all you had to do was cross a border without permission or consequence? Would you do it? Yet there are some Americans eager to blame the illegal alien not just for violating our laws, but for the fact those laws are not being enforced in the first place. A law that is not enforced is a waste of time and energy. 
So who is ultimately responsible for the fact that our border crossing laws are not being enforced? Is it the alien who breaks those laws? Is it the criminal who takes advantage of the lax enforcement of those laws? Or is it the federal agent on the border? No. There are only two groups of people responsible for the fact that our border laws are not being enforced. The first is a group of politicians, both in Washington, D.C. and in our states, who are either refusing to fulfill their duties to enforce the laws of the United States or are willing to stand by and do nothing while it happens. The second is the American people who put up with them. President James A. Garfield said, Now more than ever, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress. If that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it is because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. If it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it is because the people demand these high qualities to represent them in the national legislature. What was true of Congress in the 19th century is also true of all elected officers today. We are responsible for their character. That means we are responsible for how we respond to their actions as well. We have chosen presidents who tried to enforce our border laws and others who did not. We chose the representatives and senators that not only wrote those laws, but funded their enforcement. And when those in the judicial branch acted badly by illegally meddling with the enforcement of the Constitution and laws of the United States, it was the responsibility of those we place in Congress to deal with their bad behavior. So if you're looking for someone to blame for the current state of our border, look no farther than your mirror. Rather than blaming the alien who broke the law, take responsibility for your choices that led to the fact that those laws aren't being enforced in the first place. I know, we don't want to admit it's our fault. We, we want to blame somebody else. It's natural, it's human, and it's destroying the republic. Yes, President Biden is not enforcing the border laws, the, the immigration laws. Yes, Congress has made a mess of the, of the immigration laws, and they've refused to fund proper enforcement of them. But we hired all of these people, every member of the House, every member of the Senate, and now even the president and vice president are hired by us. They are our employees, and if they're acting with such malfeasance, it's our responsibility for first putting them there, for not removing them, and then for putting them back when their contract is up. This is our fault. And simply calling it an invasion to rile people up or get an emotional background to try and push some agenda doesn't fix the problem. It only makes it worse. Trying to come up with a definition of invasion to support your opinion is exactly the same thing lawyers and judges do to try to twist what the Constitution says to get the outcome they want. So let's not do that. Let's recognize the failure of this administration to enforce our immigration laws. Let's recognize the failure of Congress, both the House and the Senate, to properly fund the enforcement of those laws and the tools necessary to actually do the enforcement. Let's also blame the governments in our states for first turning over immigration to the federal government and then sitting by while the federal government screwed this up and doing little, if anything. And if we started hiring people that actually enforced the laws, that actually made the laws that were that were within the constitutions they were, that created those offices, well, then maybe this wouldn't be as big a deal. But nothing's going to change until we the people change, until we the people change how we vet our candidates, until we look at them as employees and start treating them that way. See, when those we place in an office are more worried about what we think than about what their political party or their special interest groups think, until that day comes, we're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome, which I believe Albert Einstein referred to as insanity. Now, if you want to find out more, head to constitutionstudy.com to where you find everything that I'm working on. Hey, you have a comment. Leave me a comment. Leave me a question on this article, on this episode. What do you think? Check out the references. Check out the links. We need to think and analyze what's going on around us, and this is a place you can help. You can also join Constitution Scholars. You can find others that are just as interested in reading and studying the Constitution, learning what it means to be free, and then learning how to actually live free, how to actually defend and assert their rights. Now, any way you can support these groups would be wonderful. They help me put on these, these episodes. They help me write the articles. They help me speak around the country to help educate people about the Constitution. 
Now, if all you can do is visit the website and share those articles, that's great. I appreciate that. Let's get the word out so that more and more people understand that there is an answer, that, that we're not living at the whim of others unless we let ourselves. See, if we want to remain the land of the free, we're going to have to once again learn how to live free. That means putting our employees in government offices back under our control. Now, hopefully, you learned something in this episode. Hopefully, you'll share this episode. And hopefully, you'll come back here for the next episode on the Constitution Study. You know, by the way, bring a friend. There's one thing you have to